Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Pin Duo Duo Second Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After management's prepared remarks, there will be a Q&A session. Today's conference call is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your speaker today, Mr. Hua Deng. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you, Rachel. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. Pinodo's earnings release was distributed earlier and is available on the IR website at investor.pinodo.com, as well as through Global Newswire services. On today's call, our CEO Chen Lei will make some general remarks on our performance for the second quarter of 2020 and his primary areas of focus going forward. Our VP of Strategy, David Liu, will then elaborate further on our specific strategic initiatives. Last but not least, our VP of Finance, Tony Ma, will take us through our financial results for the second quarter ended June 30, 2020. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you that this conference contains forward-looking statements within the meaning of Section 21E of the U.S. Securities Exchange Act of 1934, as amended and as defined in the U.S. Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. These forward-looking statements can be identified by terminologies such as will anticipate and similar statements. Such statements are based upon management's current expectations, the current market operating conditions, and relate to events that involve known or unknown risks, uncertainties, and other factors, all of which are difficult to predict and many of which are beyond the company's control, which may cause the company's actual results, performance, and achievements to differ materially from those in the forward-looking statement. Further information regarding these and other risks, uncertainties, or factors are included in the company's filings with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. The company does not undertake any obligation to update any forward-looking statements as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise except as required under applicable law. Now it is my pleasure to introduce our Chief Executive Officer Chen Lei. Lei, please go ahead. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you to our second quarter 2020 results announcement. This is my first time communicating with investors around the world as CEO, even though I met many of you two years ago in our IPO roadshow. It's great to reconnect, and I look forward to working together again and building ongoing dialogue. I'm joined today by our Vice President of Strategy, David Liu, and our Vice President of Finance, Tony Ma. In the past month and a half, we have been busy with the management transition that was announced on July 1st. It was an evolving process that started three years ago, and the recent decision was made with the full support of our board. We've always been thinking about how to create more opportunities to grow the next generation of leaders, and how to keep this organization young, vibrant, and at the same time increasingly institutionalized. This is especially important in our fast-changing tech industry. We need to challenge ourselves continuously and to incorporate fresh perspectives so as to constantly satisfy and serve our users' needs. At the same time, we need to build a solid foundation for long-term and sustainable development of the organization. Having built Pinduoduo into one of the bigger platforms in China and observing the numerous initiatives by the team through the pandemic, if the timing was right to pass on to our younger generation leaders more responsibility. Pinduoduo has grown at an extraordinary pace in the past five years. We were later focused on our survival and growth. However, in the next few years, my goal is to translate this platform into the next level, one that is vibrant, innovative, energetic, and institutionalized. The management and the board hope to lay the strong foundation over the next few years to create a long-lasting organization and an ecosystem that serves our society. Colin has seen take a step back from the day-to-day -day management responsibility of a CEO, but he continues to be fully engaged and has been working closely with the board and the management to explore the company's future strategic causes and organizational structure. Colin is also devoting more time to investigate and support foundational, fundamental research in areas that become the future driver of a company, 
Talk to us, ask me, tax. We believe this new division of labor allows Carl and I to cooperate efficiently and steer a company in its next phase of growth and development. With over 1 trillion RMB of GMV and 683 million annual active buyers, Pinodo is operating at significantly larger scale and with much greater complexity today. We have demonstrated that our user-centric strategy works and we will continue to do what we do well, to offer valuable money products to our users through a fun and interactive experience. As we continue to see significant potential ahead for our platform, my priority as CEO are on the various internal and external initiatives that we deem necessary to support and generate long-term sustainable values for our platform. Internally, it's important that we continue to make operational decisions efficiently despite our growing number of business units and employees. I'm working with our team to leverage more technology to streamline internal processes and institutionalize best practices. We are also focused on hiring the best talent and improving personal development. We continue to encourage mobility within our organization and motivate our employees to generate new ideas and compete for resources. Externally, we are going to increase strategic investment in our ecosystem, particularly in agricultural value chain. Our investment in the past five years has been primarily on our users by our sales and marketing expenses and we have successfully built a very substantial user base of nearly 600 million in record time. Our average daily parcel volume accounts for approximately 25% of China's daily parcel shipment. However, in terms of average spending per active buyers, we still see substantial upside potential. We will continue to invest in building user engagement and make sure to grow our user frequency of purchases and average order value. At the same time, we plan to pursue more strategic investment and partnership opportunities that will allow us to accelerate digitization of our supply chain and to enhance efficiency and values that can be shared with our consumers. In particular, we started our business in agriculture and we plan to continue our focus in agriculture as our next strategic priority. Agriculture is a sector that touches the largest number of people and yet has had the least amount of digitization in the past decade. Any technology that can improve productivity and efficiency our agricultural value chain will have a huge impact. Pinduoduo is already one of China's leading online distribution platforms for agriculture produce and agriculture products. We are uniquely positioned to drive change in China's agriculture system. We comply consumer demand on our platform to create scale, and we can leverage consumer insights we gain to help farmers make more informed decisions across planting cycle, including what to plant and when to harvest. We are prepared to invest in technology and operations across different parts of the agriculture value chain in order to accelerate e-commerce penetration for the category and generate more value for both the farmers and the consumers. Our aim is to further consolidate our position as China's number one online agriculture platform and to build a worldwide presence in agriculture. Let me now turn over to Dennis to discuss some of our specific thoughts around agriculture. Thank you, Larry. One in four Chinese workers work in agriculture, but the industry makes up less than 10% of China's GDP. This is because agriculture has lagged behind other industries in digitization. Nearly 98% of farmers in China work on farms smaller than two hectares. It is difficult to standardize growing practices and achieve economies of scale. The rural workforce is aging and in decline as young people choose to work in the cities. 
a lack of coordination for food production leaves farmers vulnerable to price swings, while wastage and high incremental distribution costs add to consumers' burden. Those are the challenges. And the opportunity is that agriculture e-commerce can solve a number of these problems. Based on figures from the Ministry of Commerce, the implied total addressable market in 2019 for B2C agricultural goods sales in China was 8.1 trillion RMB, with less than 7% of these sales taking place online. In contrast, the online penetration for physical goods in total was 23% in 2019. Pinduoduo is already one of the leading e-commerce platforms for agriculture. In 2019, we generated 136.4 billion RMB, or 13.6% of our GMB from agriculture produce and related goods. Over 240 million, or 38% of our annual active buyers, purchased in this category last year, with a 70% repurchase rate. Pinduoduo has become the go-to destination for high-quality, great-value agriculture products. This recognition deepened through the pandemic. During 618, we saw orders for agriculture products grew 136% to 380 million. Nearly three quarters of the orders came from tier one and tier two city users. We expect to continue gaining market sharing on agriculture, and we see potential for our agriculture GMV to exceed one trillion RMB in five years. Why do we think agriculture e-commerce can be tackled, can tackle the challenges outlined earlier? Well, put simply, only when you digitize demand and supply, then can you drive efficiency and gains through the value chain in between. Online retail has an advantage in terms of greater visibility. From production all the way to distribution, we have a unique position to make the value chain more efficient and bring more value to producers and consumers through investment and partnership that can also unlock commercial opportunities. Our vision is to realize the economic potential of China's vast agricultural uh, resources by improving its overall quality and production efficiency. Starting with production, our efforts thus far have centered around the development of human capital through farmer training as well as initiation of pilot farms uh, in our Dodo Farms program. Together with partner institutions such as China Agriculture University, we have imparted farming knowledge and business training to almost 90,000 new farmers thus far, who tend to be younger and more digitally savvy. We see this initiative as a way to see a new generation of farmers who are more adaptive to new technologies. Dodo Farms is a demonstration of how reorganizing resources through cooperatives and bringing agronomic expertise can help farmers living in impoverished regions sustainably improve their productivity and household income. Dodo Farms serve as a testbed for us to introduce technologies to farmers such as drip irrigation while also introducing changes to existing farming practices to drive meaningful change. Building upon these experiences, we plan to invest in technology necessary to implement precision farming, such as robotics, IoT sensors, and low-power data transmission. Precision farming can help optimize inputs, better control diseases, and reduce production costs. Our ongoing smart agriculture competition, jointly organized with the Agriculture University of China, and with the support of UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, exemplifies our interest to identify cost-efficient and scalable technology that can be promoted as standardized solution across China. Global teams are competing over 14 weeks to remotely grow strawberries using sensors and machine learning algorithms. The objective is to derive the most cost-efficient techniques to improve yield by integrating technology with traditional growing practices. We also plan to further invest in and develop our proprietary agriculture analytics system. By considering historical and projected data, such as price, quantity, geographic distribution, and logistical availability, the system will better advise farmers on which crops of high economic value to plant, how to optimize quality over quantity, and how to achieve more timely distribution. The system will also help refine our recommendations to consumers to reduce mismatch in supply and demand. Traditionally, agriculture produ pro uh, produce go through at least five layers of distribution before reaching consumers. Industry research estimates as much as 105% added cost 
37% wastage across the chain for vegetables. Pinduoduo's team purchase model aggregates scattered interest into sizable coordinated demand and connects sellers directly with consumers to eliminate unnecessary costs. The next step is to find further, is further optimize logistics for agricultural produce. From how it is packaged, handled, and routed, there are hardly any cost-effective specialized solution for agricultural produce today. We plan to partner with logistics services providers to develop, develop logistics dedicated to agriculture. As we can forecast demand by region, we can develop technology solutions with logistics partners to optimize delivery routes, coordinate delivery schedules, implement better quality service standards, and optimize loading to and from the rural areas of China. We are also looking at advanced packaging solutions to offer our sellers and considering opportunities in warehousing technology and temperature control logistics. We will also invest in technology for quality control and food safety. Unlike manufactured goods, it is more difficult to provide assurance on the quality and safety of agricultural produce. As consumers in China become more health conscious, we expect more will be willing to pay a premium for quality and safety. We intend to address such needs through a combination of technology and certification backed by credible platforms. We started collaborating this year with a research institution to develop a cost-effective, robust method for uh, testing fresh produce for contaminants like pesticides. We envision deploying such tests across a wide array of produce and at various points of the supply chain to provide greater assurance on food safety. We can offer such testing solutions and certification as value-added services to our farmers and merchants. Certified products will receive preferential traffic support and command a premium from our users. Our ability to differentiate such products will allow us to curate and price SKUs based on quality and recommend them to the relevant target users. With better quality products, it is equally or perhaps more important to invest in marketing to grow brand awareness. Take the French region of Champagne as an example. Sparkling wines made in Champagne are tightly regulated and must be made from a few prescribed varietals using traditional methods to ensure consistent quality. Its sterling, rigorously defended reputation fuels consumers' willingness to pay a premium. Similarly in China, given its vast agricultural resources, we see opportunities to help create new brands for consistently high-quality produce from the various geographic indications around the country. In fact, one of our Dodo Farm projects in Yunnan is working to establish a nationally recognized destination for Yakong grown there. To meet the destination, farmers will have to standardize and improve their farming practices. Farmers are incentivized to improve their practices in exchange for their products fetching a premium. And we as a platform can provide more visibility to farmers on sales volume and pricing. We can help build awareness and promote origin stories through marketing, including virtual live streaming tours. The recognition of quality provides further opportunity to develop related sub-industries, from selling oranges to making marmalade, and from selling peaches to developing ecotourism. We see potential to work with farmers and distributors to develop branding for their produce and to address other value-added opportunities leveraging our consumer insights. While this may be a long journey, we are committed to investing in agriculture and agritech as it enables us to truly benefit all of our platform participants. Now let me pass it to Tony to discuss our financial results for the second quarter. Uh, <coughs> thank you, David. For the 12 months ended June 30th, 2020, our GMV increased 79% to RMB 1.27 trillion from R&D 709 billion a year ago. As a result of higher user engagement and increased spending per user. We report GMV on the same basis as other industry players to provide a meaningful comparison with that of our peers. The industry definition includes canceled and returned orders. Comparing our GMV in Q2 versus Q1, the level of canceled and returned orders has returned to normal historical level as China recovers from the pandemic. Our average monthly active users in the second quarter increased by 81 million from the previous quarter to 569 million, or an increase of 55% from a year ago. 
our annual active buyers for the 12 months ended June 30th grow 41% year over year to reach 683 million. This represents a net add of more than 200 million in the past 12 months. The annual spending per active buyer in the 12 month period ended June 30, 2020, increased 27% to RMB 1857 from RMB 1468 for the same period in 2019. The increase in annual spending per active buyer was moderated by a significant number of new users added who contributed less than 12 months of purchases to our GMV. During Q2, China's economy continued its recovery from the disruption caused by the pandemic. According to National Bureau of Statistics, online sales growth of physical goods accelerated in the second quarter, resulting in a 14.3 increase for the six months ended June 30th, 2020, from a year ago. This is up significantly from 5.9% growth for the three month period ending in March. Consumer staples and household goods were significant growth contributors during this period. We observed a similar recovery trend on our platform. In Q2, our users had strong demand for household necessities and agricultural products and continue to be more selective and cautious on their discretionary, uh, discretionary spending. To address their needs, we expanded our promotional offering under the June 18 campaign to cover more household necessities, food and beverage products, and agriculture produce. We are continuing our efforts to provide compelling value in these categories together with China Consumer Association in early July. Our total revenue in June quarter were RMB 12.2 billion, representing an increase of 67% from RMB 7.3 billion in the same quarter last year. The increase was driven primarily by the strong momentum in online marketing services. Our online marketing services revenue grew 71% to RMB 11.1 billion, and our transaction service revenue increased 38% to RMB 1.1 billion. We continued our support for certain SME merchants in Q2 by offering discounted transaction fees, but in general observed a healthy recovery in merchant advertising activities. We benefited from merchants' pent up demand and deferred marketing budget from the previous quarter. We also attribute higher advertising activities to better merchant ROI due to higher user engagement on our platform and more compelling advertising products. The implied monetization rate, defined as total revenue divided by GMV for the last 12 months ended June 30, 2020, was 2.9% in line with the same period in 2019. Now moving on to cost. Our total cost of revenue this quarter increased 67% from RMB 1.6 billion in the same period last year to RMB 2.7 uh, billion this quarter, translating to a growth margin of 78%. Total cost of revenue increased mainly due to higher costs for cloud services, call center, and merchant support services. Total operating expenses this quarter were RMB 11.2 billion as compared to RMB 7.2 billion in the same quarter in 2019. Our sales and marketing expenses this quarter increased 49% to RMB 9.1 billion from RMB 6.1 billion in the same quarter of 2019. On a non-GAAP basis, our sales and marketing expenses as a percentage of our revenue was 73% as compared to 81% for the same quarter last year. We manage our sales and marketing spending dynamically based on expected ROI. Recognizing the fierce market dynamic in this year's 618 promotion event, we decided to moderate our investment during the second quarter. We continued with our 10 billion program and expanded our offering to cover household staples that our users were looking for. Looking ahead, 
we see significant potential to improve our users' annual spending on our platform by building more user mind share and trust. We expect to continue our sales and marketing investment in the second half of 2020 to drive more user engagement. We will continue to spend whenever we see attractive opportunities that meet our internal ROI hurdles. General and administrative expenses were RMB 395 million, an increase of 42% from RMB 278 million in the same quarter of 2019, primarily due to an increase in headcount. On a non-gap basis, our GNA expenses as a percentage of our revenue was 1.1% in Q2. Research and development expenses were RMB 1.7 billion, an increase of 107% from RMB 804 million in the same quarter of 2019. The increase was primarily due to an increase in headcount and the recruitment of more experienced R&D personnel, and an increase in R&D related cloud service expenses. On an on gap basis, our R&D expenses as a percentage of our revenues was 10.4% in Q2. Technology is fundamental to our operations, and we plan to increase our spending on engineering talent and technological capabilities going forward. So some of our key R&D initiatives include de developing our demand forecasting system for agriculture, database for C2M manufacturers, and the logistic planning system. As a result, our operating loss for the quarter was RMB 1.6 billion on a gap basis compared with operating loss of RMB 1.5 billion in the same quarter of 2019. Non-gap operating loss for the quarter was RMB 725 million compared with RMB 898 million in the same quarter of 2019. For the quarter end of June 30th, 2020, we recorded net non-operating income of RMB 740 million compared with RMB 487 million in the same quarter in 2019. The increase primarily reflects the net impact of higher interest income, interest expenses from amortization of our outstanding convertible bonds, and the gains on fair market value change from long-term investments. We excluded the later two items in addition to share-based compensation in our presentation of non-GAAP matrix. To sum up, our net loss attributable to ordinary shareholders was RMB 899 million on a gap basis as compared to net loss of RMB 1 billion in the same quarter of 2019. Basic and diluted net loss per ADF was RMB 0.75 on a gap basis compared with RMB 0.88 in the same quarter of 2019. Non-gap net loss attributable to ordinary shareholders was RMB 77 million compared with RMB 411 million in the same quarter last year. Non-GAAP basic and diluted net loss per ADS were RMB 0.06 compared with RMB 0.36 in the same quarter of 2019. That completes the profit and loss statement for the second quarter. Now on the cash flow. Our net cash flow generated by operating activities was RMB 5.5 billion as compared to RMB 4.1 billion in the same quarter of 2019, primarily due to an increase in online marketing service revenues. As of June 30th, 2020, the company's cash reserve, comprising of cash, cash equivalent, and short-term investment, was RMB 49 billion as compared to RMB 41.1 billion at the end of December 2019. We allocated most of our cash reserve to highly liquid short-term investment to receive better cash yield and maintain flexibility to withdraw and deploy capital strategically as necessary. Finally, let me touch on the ongoing development in the U.S. Um, to prohibit foreign issuers access the U.S. capital market if sufficient audit access cannot be provided to the U.S. Public Company Accounting Oversight Board. On August 6, the President's Working Group on Financial Market released its report recommending SEC to implement rules that would require issuers to grant PCAOB access to work papers of the principal audit firm 
in order to maintain this thing by January 1st, 2022. The recommendations also provide an option for companies to provide a co-audit from an audit firm that meets PCAOB's inspection requirements. The administration's recommendation, if adopted, would still require SEC to design and put in place detailed implementation pl uh, rules. We continue to monitor the situation closely and uh, uh, are prepared to work with relevant regulators in China and the U.S. to address these concerns when there's more clarity. We completed our SOX internal control audit for 2019 with no material deficiency identified. We are confident of the quality uh, of our disclosure and the financial reporting, and we are committed to continuing our efforts to provide a high degree of integrity in our accounting. This concludes our prepared remarks. Operator, we are ready for questions. Ladies and gentlemen, we will now begin the question and answer session. If you wish to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone and wait for your name to be announced. If you wish to cancel your request, please press the pound or hash key. Your first question comes from the line. Okay, one. Once again, if you wish to ask a question, please press star one on your telephone. Your first question comes from the line of uh, Gregory Zhao of Barclays. Please ask your question. Mr. Gregory Zhao, your line is now open. I'm sorry, I was mute. So thanks for taking my question. Uh, so uh, we saw PDD make some efforts to move up to the high-end market and st started to sell some luxury products, including Tesla cars. So I uh, just want to understand a bit more about how this will help you to improve uh, the ARPU and help you to uh, get expanded into, into the high-end market. Uh, a, quick, a quick one on the UV growth of the GMA growth. So we know last year uh, was the first time uh, you, uh, you joined the 618 promotion uh, season. Uh, so uh, how shall we think about the relatively high base uh, uh, the impact to our 2Q GMB growth. Thank you. Uh, Gregory, thanks for the question. Um, uh, let me take your first question around brands and products. Um, our pro product and brand strategy um, is actually more oriented around giving users what they want and serving um, them well. So it is not our intention um, um, to build uh, um, or uh, engaging in uh, the, the type of promotion that you have seen, the intention is not to drive our AOV. The aim is actually to build Pinduoduo into a destination for quality, authentic, and value for money product across categories and price points. So we are continuing to grow the depth of, and breadth of SKU across the platform, um, whether they are branded or unbranded. Um, in fact, as I highlighted in my comments earlier, we are highlighting agriculture as a product category where we think we can strategically add a lot of value over the next uh, few years by investing in our supply chain and making available higher quality and better product uh, for our users. And with regard to your question on GMV, First of all, I would like to just remind um, the audience that the comparing our uh, uh, GMV growth in the second quarter versus the first quarter is a meaningful because of the impact of the pandemic. In fact, we are very pleased with our GMV growth this quarter, um, and particularly in the context of having added 100 million of active buyers since the beginning of this year. Our focus as a company this year in terms of our strategy is to continue to invest in user engagement, um, and to build that mind share. Um, because as you look at um, the uh, scale of the user base we have accumulated, like 683 million active buyers, um, we believe um, that what we need to do is continue to improve the engagement with them and to grow that mind share. 
The, um, the GMV for the second quarter are impacted. I will also note that um, uh, changes in consumer spending. We saw a pickup in consumer activity uh, since the first quarter as the econo economy recovered. However, we did notice that consumer spending was much more value conscious, and consumers were looking for more household necessities such as FNCGs and agricultural produce um, on our platform. So as you saw in our 618 campaign, we actually um, expanded our coverage in the uh, campaign to cover more products in these categories, and we are continuing to support the consumers in these efforts. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Piyush Mubai of Goldman Sachs. Please ask your question. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, may I just ask a couple of details on how, how the transaction commission revenues, marketing services revenues, are progressing and how that take rate has evolved. Your marketing service take rate seems to have gone up to 3.2% in the quarter, which is a huge, uh, which is a huge improvement uh, year on year on any other metric, probably the highest ever. Should we then think of that as a number that we can expect for you to continue to maintain in the future? And also, when you look at uh, the growth rates in transaction commissions, which was 76% in 1Q, uh, that slowed down to 38%. Is there, is there anything there that's different that would lead, us, that lead to that slow growth rate? And in, in a similar manner, the marketing services revenue, which is at 78, 71%, is meaningfully higher than the pace of growth that you're seeing in the GMV uh, for the quarter. So if you could just take us through what's going on there, then I have a few questions on agriculture, if I might. Thank you. Okay. Uh, let me take this one then. Uh, we do, do saw a stronger than expected recovery in uh, mon uh, merchants advertising in Q2. Uh, our merchant had more budget to spend given limited activities in Q1, uh, and, and, and they were eager to make up for their loss in, uh, in Q1 and higher user um, activities and better advertising product also helped to improve the advertising returns. Um, our higher tick rate in Q2 reflects the, uh, the, the, the supply-demand dynamic post the pandemic, actually. The level of returned and unpaid order also returned to the normal level. If we uh, take together our Q1 and Q2 number as an aggregate level, the, uh, the tick rate for the first half of the year actually is 2.9% in line with our historical results. Uh, tick rate for us is an output, not an KPI. Uh, we try to optimize. Uh, our our pri priority is on our user engagement. Um, with stronger user engagement, merchants would naturally want to advertise more. Uh, we will continue to support uh, good quality merchants and incentivize them to improve their service and provide better value uh, to our users. And regarding the second question or um, the question on, on the transaction service revenue, um, the transaction service revenue comprised primarily of what we previously termed uh, commission fees, the payment process fees, which we charge at a standard rec rate of 0.6%. However, uh, we continue to offer a preferential rate for certain merchants as an as incentive. And May, may I just ask a follow-up question? Just wanted to understand where, what percentage of the GMB today is agriculture, say, for the second quarter. And when you talk about a trillion five years out, we presume that's about 15 to 20 percent of GMB at that point in time. Would that be the right mix to think through uh, for agriculture? And if you could just give us a feel for the sort of take rate that we could earn from a business, would it be commensurate to are comparable to the 3.2, for example, that you've shown us in QQ, uh, by, uh, five years down the line, I mean. Thank you. Pierce, thank you for that. Um, uh, let me just also add a little bit to our uh, context around the take rate. Um, as we have communicated to the market previously, uh, the take rate really is an output. It's a function of the merchants advertising on our platform and seeing the right levels of return. So we actually saw uh, in the second quarter uh, very strong uh, merchant activities 
um, as merchants try to um, uh, uh, sell more, um, uh, move more inventories and goods in the second quarter. And as a result, we saw very strong um, advertising demand, uh, which we think actually contributed uh, to that um, take rate. Similarly, we, I would note that um, on our platform, um, it's, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, on our platform, we are seeing advertising activities really across the board uh, from uh, many different sectors. So it, it is in any uh, particular categories per se. And similarly, we do believe there are potentials in agriculture. Um, uh, merchants and uh, distributors to contribute to advertising um, as long as they are able to actually offer the type of premium product that allows them to generate the type of return. So what we are seeing is given the low um, e-commerce penetration rate in agriculture, we actually see substantial opportunity for us to invite, uh, invest in a supply chain and to drive more value creation uh, down the road. So yes, um, we do believe that you know, um, certainly uh, generating the type of uh, return commensurate um, with what the platform is generating today is possible in agriculture, um, but that may come in the form of both advertising and also us providing technology solutions uh, to the participants in our ecosystem. Thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Alicia Yap of Citigroup. Please ask your question. Hi. Um, good evening, management. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I have a question related to uh, more medium, longer term. Um, so how will PDD um, attract broader varieties of merchants and brands to join the platform uh, when you indeed now have a larger base of merchants and then you also have um, the, your user base are also reaching a quite large number. So how do you balance uh, and ensure uh, all the merchants will receive the relevant exposure uh, and what does PDD need to do to serve this broader range of the merchants? And how will um, you know, the team purchase model uh, evolve uh, if we uh, get more branded um, products or branded merchants uh, on our platform. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Alicia. Um, our strategy um, around uh, brand, uh, products and brands have not changed. Um, in fact, as I mentioned earlier uh, today, uh, the idea is to continue to focus on providing what the users want. Um, uh, so from that perspective, um, what we are seeing is um, the team purchase model working, um, and this is the reason why we have been able to accumulate 700 million users uh, within such a short period of time. And this continues to work because we are a recommendation-based business model focusing on specific SKUs as opposed to on brands. Right? So um, we do believe that the, uh, as everyone's um, uh, demand on the platform uh, really ranges across different price points uh, for different categories. And through, um, as we continue to get better our recommendation, we understand the users better. We are able to push them the most relevant products um, at the most relevant price points. And as the user activities and user engagement grows, the merchants naturally are coming to our platform seeking for growth and more opportunities. And the merchants themselves are, would be able to uh, uh, get the right level of traffic if they are able to offer the right value um, for their customer base. So what we are doing is um, through the algorithms and through our recommendation, working with the merchants to help them provide more suitable uh, products that are um, targeted at the, uh, at the users. Um, and we believe the algorithm is working and continuing over time while recommendation will get better. And uh, through a combination of offering the right product and also advertising on the platform, we believe the merchants will continue to see their attractive returns on their investments. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from the line of Thomas Chong of Jefferies. Please ask your question. Sorry, Carrie. 
Hey, Thomas, um, is the question around our uh, strategy or the trends we're seeing across different categories? Um, operator, maybe we can take the next question first before we take Thomas back. Certainly, your next question comes from the line of Tina Long of Credit Suisse, please ask your question. Hi, hi, management. Thank you for taking my questions. I have two questions. Uh, the first one is on the sales marketing, uh, because in your prepare with Marks, you mentioned that uh, you intentionally moderate the uh, sales marketing spending uh, due to, uh, I think, probably uh, uh, peers actually have been pretty aggressive. Uh, and also, you extended uh, the 10 million program to some daily necessities. So I want to know uh, in the next two quarters, third quarter and, and fourth quarter, uh, what are the uh, plans for your sales marketing and uh, 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 under what circumstances you will actually step up uh, the sales marketing? That's the first question. Uh, I'll, I'll do the second one uh, after this. Thank you. Sure, Tina. Let me ask Tony to address the question. Um, first of all, the Q2 on sales and marketing expenses, we say, uh, the moderate our sales and marketing spending is when we observe um, this aggressive promotion spending by our peers on electronics. Uh, relative to that, we saw household goods as a more attractive opportunity to advance user engagement. Therefore, um, household goods has actually has a higher purchase frequency than electronics. So uh, we choose a different strategy to invest in, in Q2. Um, we actually plan to deepen our user engagement going forward so that we will continue to spend on sales and marketing in, in the coming quarters to grow the mind share and trust among our users. We expect to increase our sales and marketing investment in second half of 2020 in a prudent manner um, as long as uh, we uh, spend whenever we see opportunity meets our internal ROI hurdles. Our, actually, uh, our annual spending per active user are still le lags behind our peers. Um, we believe we, we, can, we can narrow that difference uh, by growing our mind share with users and gain great, uh, to, to get more wallet share. Uh, that's why we have to continue this type of investment. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Yeah, my, my first question is sort of related to this because um, – uh, I, I think based on the public data, uh, the um, password volume uh, is actually very strong from TV. Uh, so, uh, uh, but the GMV actually was uh, uh, sort of uh, slower. Uh, so does that imply the average order size is that actually trending down? Uh, can you share a little bit more about the uh, average order size and also the outlook? Because if you continue to uh, allocate more traffic to the household goods, so will we con uh, continue to see the average order size to be uh, to stay at a low level? Thank you. Um, um, let me take this. Uh, users um, tends to associate Pinduoduo as their go-to platform uh, for great savings every day. Um, so for us, we also tend to have a less of a concentrated spike in GMV and the user activities around shopping promotion, uh, unlike our users, uh, our peers. Um, our user engagement tends to trend in a, in a steady fashion and, and reflective, which reflective of our gain in building our mind share. Um, we will continue to invest in, in the user mind share and build on high frequency of engagement. Um, in fact, that's what we did in Q2. We noticed the consumer spending was more uh, value cautious, and uh, the consumer were looking for more household necessities, uh, including FMCG agriculture produce. Um, that's why we, we did, uh, dedicated our promotional program during the June 18th to include more products in these categories. This definitely have an impact on the AOB. Uh, also, we add almost 100 million active buyers since beginning of this year, and these users uh, are just getting to know Pinduoduo, and actually their contribution to the GMV is less than 12 months. Uh, also, they are still developing their uh, spending behavior on our platform. Okay. 
Okay. So does that mean the outlook of AOE, AOV will, will stay at a lower level for a longer period of time? Tina, so what we have seen in the second quarter is a growth across the categories. But as I mentioned, the consumer behaviors in the second quarter were more value conscious, and we adapted the marketing strategy accordingly. Um, so we do believe that, you know, Pindu, uh, many users associate Pinduoduo as a platform where they would go for great value product, and we have seen uh, people coming to us um, in the second quarter particularly looking for, that pro for those products. Um, we find these product categories to be quite compelling in a sense because they have a high frequency, high engagement, and we do believe that over time the AOB will continue to grow as um, they build their, um, uh, their shopping behavior, their spending behaviors on platform over time. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Your next question comes from Thomas Chong of Jeff. Please ask your question. Uh, hi, good evening. Kings Management, once again, my questions. Uh, can you comment about the live streaming uh, online shopping uh, strategy? Thank you. Um, Thomas, in terms of live streaming, um, we have seen uh, continuing adoption of our merchants using the live streaming as a feature to create engagement with, um, their, uh, with uh, the consumers on our platform. However, as, um, uh, however, we do not position or uh, do not consider live streaming to be a separate uh, marketing tool. Um, we consider it really as part of the integrated uh, experience in our platform. So, um, uh, so on Pinduoduo, as you will note, um, that we don't have actually a dedicated channel at entrance for live streaming. Instead, you actually are, um, uh, our users come in contact or come in access to the live streaming room through their browsing experiences. Um, as they explore the SKU, they will notice that this particular SKU may be in uh, live streaming, and they will click into the live streaming and uh, view the product uh, being introduced. And in that context, they may choose to purchase or they may choose to bookmark the seller. Um, or actually, they may have seen something and then through the, then through the browsing next time they end up purchasing. So we do and we position intentionally live streaming to be part of the holistic experiences that our merchant can offer to our users and seem to add to that um, uh, exploration, exploratory um, um, experiences that our, our users have on the platform. Yes, one more thing I'd like to add is uh, live streaming will be one of the new demands our customer has posted uh, in this year. And actually, there are many others. And then we try to have a full perspective understanding about our customers. And uh, we actually have more than just one feature try to capture different kinds of needs, uh, different kinds of demands our customer has, uh, has, 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 has had. Uh, since the starting of this year. So I would believe that let's just be one of them, but not all of them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Operator, next question, please. Your last question comes from the line of Minnie Wong of HSBC. Please ask your question. Hi, good evening, management. Uh, congrats on a strong improvement in the bottom line. Um, I have two questions here. First question is on the monetization rate. It's true that uh, three, I mean, the second quarter, the monetization rate sharply increased to 3.2%. But if we look at on a half year basis, right, there's only there's around a uh, 2.5, which is just similar to what we have done in the past years. So should we just think of it? This is more about a rising S spending from the pent up demand, um, or should we think about second quarter? Is there some structural positive drivers that can last into the second half of the year? Uh, so it's just directionally um, thinking about it. And then uh, following on on that is that if we're thinking about uh, the, the, the rising online marketing from which, pool, uh, which advertising um, uh, categories, is it because that we also do more um, management set about the agricultural advertiser and FMCG, do they tend to see a bigger ad spending? Like do they have a bigger ad pocket? Um, thank you. And I just have a quick follow-up. Thank you. Um, hey, Bini, thank you for the question. Um, your question around the take rate. Um, I would say that, and as I, um, uh, I would say that take rate itself really is a function of uh, merchant investing um, uh, or pay, um, buying advertising uh, to generate return for their sales. 
And um, as many of you have noted in your uh, interviews with merchants, uh, the advertising mm -hmm. return on our platform are better than that on, uh, relative to um, our peers. Um, so it is. Mm -hmm. I would consider. Uh, I urge you to consider the um, advertising mm -hmm. spend from merchants uh, from that perspective. Of course, it is true that because in the first quarter the merchants weren't in a position to spend the advertising budget, so we did benefit from some of that pent up demand. But our um, uh, conviction is that as long as we continue to deliver um, uh, better or a good, solid, attractive um, advertising return to the merchants, they will continue mm -hmm. to advertise. So we're doing this both in terms of improving our recommendation algorithm, but also improving better um, advertising products. Um, so um, as an example, we rolled out at the end of the last year um, a product that helps um, uh, uh, a smart tool that helps merchants optimize their um, advertising return, as an example. So many of the merchants on platform may not be as savvy, mm -hmm. and they don't really understand how to optimize for keywords or for banner ads. Um, however, by using our automated system, they at least are guaranteed a minimum threshold return, so they are in a better position and more willing uh, to spend. Mm -hmm. So we do think that part of that um, uh, pick out has to do with um, the better advertising products that we are providing. And also, mm -hmm. of course, you, know, you cannot do this without mm -hmm. a very, very active user. So as I mentioned on our call, um, our strategy this year is to continue to invest in user engagement. And with user engagement, we believe the return um, to merchants advertising will continue to be attractive, and they will continue to have that demand over time. Um, as your question specifically around advertising tools, um, um, uh, as you know, we started our business our advertising business in uh, primarily in search. But our, as our business model focuses on uh, recommendation, we have seen pickup, and we expect to continue to see pickup. Um, see advertising um, um, as a contributor to the online marketing um, uh, services revenue. Mm, okay. Thank you so much. And just a, a, a quick question here is that um, is every, I mean is a very good quarter that we see the operating margin is historically the, um, the the narrowest in terms of the losses. It's a significant improvement in the operating margin side. Um, do you think this is something that uh, we can extrapolate because of this efficiency and we wish kind of like an equilibrium as to how much we spend and then how much we can grow our uh, top line? Um, or is it that we should expect some quarterly fluctuation? Because I do understand sales and marketing is uh, that's quite uh, impacted by seasonality. Um, so should we think about this to extrapolate into the second half? And is that something that is kind of like we reached this inflection point already? Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think you're talking about the um, the profitability uh, the question here. Mm. Um, yes, that's right. Our Q2 results. Uh, um, do demonstrate how leverageable our business model is and how we could deliver profitability in, a, in the short term. Uh, but we don't, don't believe it is the right strategy to focus on a short-term profit over a sustainable long-term value. Um, our vision is to offer value for money products to all users through fun and interactive shopping experience. Uh, we still need to continue our investment to grow user mindset and engagement as, you know, we mentioned the previous, uh, several times in the in the in the um, prepared remarks. Um, so hmm. we are not considering profitability in, in, in this year. Okay. Uh, actually, okay. we also plan to set, step up our investment in our ecosystem through a strategic partnership and capital investment uh, to better support our merchant in offering better value and better service to our users. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. That's very very clear. Super clear. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Benny. I would now like to hand the conference back to the presenters for the closing remarks. Please go ahead. Thanks, Alfredo. And thanks, everyone, for joining us on the conference call today. If you have any further follow-up questions, please feel free to reach out to the IR team. We are always here for you. Thank you, and have a good weekend. Ladies and gentlemen, that does conclude our conference for today. Thank you for participating. You may now all disconnect.